Okay, welcome to this Alt and Aperio screenside chat on ethics and learning technology perspectives from the pandemic. I'm Ian Dolphin. I'm the current executive director of Aperio. If you're not familiar with Aperio, it's a membership organization, largely of higher education uh, institutions, which collaborate to produce open source software. Uh, this panel, as you might have guessed, is about global responses to the pandemic and concerns that have been raised, not just in our community, but across higher education, about privacy extending outwards from legal to ethical concerns. If you have questions, please ask them. You can ask them via Twitter. The hashtag is openaperio21 or in the frame on the pod page that you're viewing this from. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Marin from Alt, because this is a partnership uh, screenside chat with the Association for Learning Technology, and I'm very pleased it is. Thank you, Ian, for the warm welcome, and hello to everybody who is joining us here. This is my first Open Aperio conference, and I'm delighted that we are collaborating on this session. My name is Dr. Maren Deepal. I'm the Chief Executive of ALT, the Association for Learning Technology in the UK, but we have members all across the world. And one of the key pieces of work we've been engaging in over the past six months is to develop an ethical framework for professional practice in learning technology. Thanks, Maren. Perhaps the panel could introduce themselves, starting with Bala, just say a few words about who you are. Uh, thank you. Bonjour à tous. Uh, my name is Bella Abrams. I am the IT Director at the University of Sheffield. We're a large uh, research intensive uh, university in the north of England. Um, I am also a trustee of ALT with a background of working with learning technology for most of my career. And I also have a, a real interest in the ethics of using uh, technology and ensuring that we get the best for our students and for our staff who choose that technology. Um, so that's why I'm here on the panel today. Thanks, Bella. Over to you, Paul, for an intro. Hi there. I'm Paul Prinsloo. I'm from the University of South Africa, down south in Africa, uh, where we are having winter, so I'm a bit freezing at the moment, but I do like to look nice. Uh, I'm a research professor in open distance learning, and my main focus is on the ethics of learning analytics and the privacy concerns with that. Thanks, Paul. Over to the man in the hat, Chuck. Uh, thanks. My name is Charles Severance. I'm a faculty member at the University of Michigan School of Information um, and uh, one of the founding members of the Sakai Project, which I like to say is, you know, eventually it's the Sakai and Moodle will be the only ways to really do learning management uh, while guaranteeing the privacy of your students. Although I think it'll be a while before the world agrees with me on that fact. And so I'm really excited about um, getting the narrative of uh, privacy uh, and protecting student data as like a, a part of the sacred trust that campus IT folks uh, should, you know, s dedicate themselves to that protection rather than dedicating themselves to the easiest possible solution, which uh, doesn't respect privacy. So putting privacy as a value that is um, on par with convenience. So, Thanks, Joe. We're going to start with uh because this was a flipped panel, and I hope all the audience have managed to find the video on the program that we shared in advance. But I wondered if the panel might just like to review uh, the other videos that they've seen, not their own at this point, and raise any issues that they'd like, highlight any pointers from the videos that they've seen, uh, and offer perhaps some brief observations to get us started. And let's do it in reverse order, so Chuck. Well, um, I, I think that uh, Paul's video talked about learning analytics and privacy, and I think that um, this is really an, an, an under, under talked about topic in that um, learner uh, analytics is like the solution to all of humanity's problems, apparently, at least from the people who are selling analytic solutions. And um, People ask me, you know, why don't you, why aren't you more critical publicly of learning analytics as privacy? And part of that is because um, it's like tilting at windmills. I mean, people are so convinced that learning analytics is such uh, 
a great thing that, you know, how could you be opposed to like oxygen? I mean, how could you don't like oxygen? And then from uh, Marin and Bella's, um, I just felt so much joy listening to somebody who is taking a quieter, gentler approach. I mean, I'm just, my goal is to just scream and shout and wave a club and and tell people that they're stupid if they're not doing privacy. And, and you may or may not be surprised, but that's not necessarily accomplishing all that much, even though it is how I feel. I feel very strongly about this. And so uh, watching Bella and Marin talk, in a way that might actually convince real policymakers and real people, and and I can be the the crazy in the background that delivers the solutions, but not I, I don't think I can motivate people to uh, to go the way I want. So th that's my reaction to the two that I saw. Thanks, Drew. Over to you, Paul. Great, uh, Chuck. One day when I grow up, I want to produce videos like you. Uh, with that aside. Uh, what I really loved what you did is to point to the fact that many institutions delegated uh, privacy to the provider and the responsibility to overlook at the et ethics that we delegate that to providers. Uh, and providers do offer institutions, especially in Africa, as a one-stop shop. Institutions in the African continent often does, don't have the capacity to do the analytics themselves. So the providers and the platform providers come in and offer us this one-stop shop uh, that is very convenient. Uh, and then Bella and Marin, I can just echo what, what Chuck said. What I really loved about your soft approach is to make room for alternative interpretations and to really open the floor to say, maybe, maybe there are other ways of looking at informed consent. Maybe there are other views on, on privacy and the ethics in using learning technologies. So thank you very much. Bella? Uh, we're in a really interesting moment and um, we're kind of, uh, there's the intersection of, of the law in some cases. There's a lot of institutions making really significant decisions without fully understanding the consequences of what they do. And as you both said, delegating the responsibility of that to people who don't have an interest. And that's one of the things that I got from both of your videos is the idea that someone else will worry about it. Um, and if someone else does worry about it, then it'll all be fine in the end. And I think that's that's the kind of risk that we run at the moment is the the uh, the worry that in two years' time, people that have made really uh, on the surface of it simple decisions about the use of the technology are actually then dealing with the adverse consequences that massively impact students, that impact the way that staff feel about the institution that they work for, and that all of those things kind of combine into possibly even a backlash in the use of technology um, from our students. And that's that was the kind of, and, and uh, uh, so thank you both for your views on kind of Marin and, and Alt and mine approach to, to how we're doing uh, the ethical framework work. I think the, the, what I wanted for us to do with having the kind of principles and then the checklist is for people to start thinking about them for themselves to understand how having principles in, uh, around the use of technology can then affect the decisions that you and possibly the wider institution that you work in uh, might be affected. And, uh, that's why uh, both of your videos were so insightful. Thank you. Over to you, Marin. Thanks, Bella. Thanks, everybody, for those introductions. And yeah, we'd like to encourage all of our participants to go and have a look at the online program if you haven't yet spotted the videos. Um, I wanted to start us off with a bit of discussion, and I think Bella's comments just now really lead well into that. So setting aside different legal frameworks for a moment, um, it seems probable that perspective of what is ethical will differ from culture to culture. And the question for the panel is, what implications do you feel this has for those who design and create technology software in a global context? So that is our opening discussion question. And um, Chuck, maybe if we come back to you first, and then um, Paul and Bella will come to you as well. Okay, Marin. I that's a that's a great question. Um, so so for me, I get around to a lot of different countries and sort of 
have this conversation with lots of people and it is entirely different um, culture to culture and here is there are there are three kinds of cultural responses um, so one is the let's do what America is doing right the the we whatever America is doing must be right so we're just going to line up and uh, examples of places where that culture is the norm are the UK for example um, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of things happen in the UK where they just install the same thing that's popular in America. They just go and say yes. I mean, I've seen that in uh, Spain, for example. Um, and then I see uh, the second kind of cultural response is one that really is, you could almost call it isolationist, and that is, this is our culture, and we are going to view this through the lens of our culture. And we don't care what the United States is doing. And we, we will, and so the, 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 a good example of that would be France and Germany, right? And so France and Germany have, I think, very high standards. And they use completely different software. And sometimes they use software that's only for their country because it's the way that uh, they can control it. Japan is kind of the same, right? They, they kind of have figured out where their center is and then they, then they stick with it. And then the, the third kind of culture, um, I would say, is probably India and China as the third kind of culture. And that is the culture that basically says everything we're doing is so sort of challenging and difficult that we're going to take the easiest solution that we can afford, that we can, can you know, just run. And, um, and so they, they, for them, privacy isn't even part of their decision making because they they already feel kind of like they've got their own little closed environment in India and China, for example. But and so that that's that's the cultural. And it, it really is: is who are you following? Are you following the United States, which is a terrible example? Are you following your own soul of your country, or are you like just like so far away that you don't really think too much about it? I am. Um, I think many people hope that they are so far away that they don't really have to think about it. But I think we can all agree that that's not going to be a viable location for for very long at all. Um, Bella, maybe if you want to come into that conversation now, and then we'll come to Paul as well. What are your thoughts? I'm hoping that my sound is slightly better. Uh, I've tried to move the microphone. Um, I think that culture and the way that people consider ethics massively impacts, but I also think that that actually is driven in some cases by um, the money available that, that Chuck's just mentioned and, and um, institutional capability or, or company capability to, to invest in, in the best possible technology. I think there's also um, kind of the way that the um, that the analytics are used or analytics or any technology are used in an organization why i think the actual choice of why something is used can drive uh, a lot of that decision making um and so uh, what we've seen in our institution during the pandemic is our uh, faculty of education making some really hard decisions about the use of technology because they were adamant that um you could not do open book examinations uh, that were unproctored in an engineering institution and in an engineering situation, which I, I didn't agree with, but they were adamant that it, it, it meant that their exams remained fair. I think what we've seen in other areas of, of our institution and more broadly in the UK, there has been more compassion around the use of technology and the use of techniques and, and, and the selection of technology, particularly in the pandemic. My question probably for the future is whether that will continue as we start to see more blended learning taking place across uh, higher education and other areas of, of teaching and learning. And, and I think that one of the reasons that we were so keen to think about our um, alt ethical principles in, in terms of a framework was to give people almost scaffolding to go through those thought processes um, whilst they were thinking about technology. And I think that's that's one of the things that we could probably use to help people adapt for all of those different conditions, which are both cultural, financial, and institutionally focused. Thanks, Bella, that's really helpful. And I think you make an interesting point around care here as well, because as, at least in the UK, but I think in other countries as well, we've seen um, a 
much more concerns around issues of, of digital poverty and digital equity, which I think we could maybe come back to at the end of this question. Um, and it would be interesting to see what, you know, from those in the room as well, if you have any any thoughts on, on how that informs our understanding of, of how to develop ethical um, open learning technology solutions. But Paul, um, let's come to you next and then and we'll see where we get with the discussion. And um, Chuck, Bella, if at any point you want to jump in, just give me a signal and we'll bring you back in. Thanks, Maren. I think what we should not underestimate, and I pointed that out in the video, is to think about the use of technologies as part of an imaginary. And I, I propose that we think in terms of a global colonial imaginary. So thinking about the framework and the frameworks that are in place come from a particular North Atlantic epistemology and ontology, the way we are and the way we see the world, as if that is the norm and if that is the only way to look at data and the only way to look at ethics. So that's the first point. The second point is that the notion of an individual providing consent is a, is a web concept or a North Atlantic concept based on the notion of a social contract between an institution and the individual. And in other cultures and in other communities, I cannot make a decision on my own. My decisions affect those around me. My, my, my decisions are decisions that affect those that came before me and those that come after me. So in, I think it's very important to consider how our frameworks embody a particular dominant narrative. So I want to, to ask just a few questions to say, how do I give consent if I'm connected to those around me and their data are my data, my data are their data? When I'm connected to the earth beneath my feet, the sky above me, those who came before me and those who follow me. When I consent, I consent to be categorized and seen through the eyes and the categories of an own entity. Dualities are in ontology and epistemology, white categories and a white male gaze. By giving permission, I allow myself, my relations, those who came before me, and those who will follow me to submit to and be colonized by the white gaze. By consenting, I perpetuate the employment of my data to serve those knowledges who do not care about me, my relations, those who came before me and those who will follow me. By providing consent, they will make claims about people like me and my data will become a tool to further exploit people like me. So, so how, what are ways to think about consent that is not embedded in the North Atlantic gaze? That's from my side, Maren. That's really, um, that's so interesting. And I think you're right, the, the North Atlantic gaze is certainly a strong one when it comes to many of the policies um, that inform the development of the tools that we're using. Um, before we move on to any further question, I just want to give both Chuck and Bella to kind of come back into this question. Um, maybe Chuck to you first and then to Bella, just for any other observations on this. So as Bella was talking, um, I was thinking to myself about my sort of revolutionary warrior perspective that I take that says you, do, you must be brave and you must go into the dangerous unknown just because I said that it's the right thing to do. And even though that's kind of how I act, I understand that what is incumbent on us is to give something that's easier to use, doesn't require as much institutional commitment, um, costs less to run. And, and so to some degree, I, it, even though I am sort of like fire breathing, I, 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 I believe that we got to dedicate ourselves in Sakai and Moodle to making these things that make the good choice a much more equivalent choice rather than just say it's the good choice it's the tough choice make the tough choice and so i'm a warrior every day but i kind of understand that there's a much longer term that that has to, if we're going to actually win the battle we actually have to take a much more gentle and long-term approach mm. uh, thank you i i think there is a longer ahead and a bit of a spirit i think is what we definitely need to to put some urgency behind this because it is an urgent matter bella we'll come to you and then ian will bring you back into the conversation as well i'm kind of thinking of both what paul and chuck have said you know the the idea that 
uh, products and services should be designed with more than just the creators in mind. So thinking about that gaze, because this this is the this is the kind of trap we all fall into: is we build something because we think it's a good idea. Uh, we don't think of something because uh, necessarily we're, we're coming rooted in a different culture or or um, uh, thinking about how other people necessarily might consume that technology other than from our own perspective. But also balancing that with everything that Chuck said, you know, the need to do things quickly, the need to do things um, that are, are frictionless in a lot of ways, because we're all facing problems that we want to solve for people as quickly as we can. So I think that's the paradox that all of us are, are working in at the moment, is how can we kind of adopt um, friction or low friction solutions that take into account the global nature of what we do? And I think the way that we do that is to keep asking questions. Why are we doing this? Who are we doing it for? Who's going to use that? Is it going to be different in South Africa or India? Or is it going to be different? And not just ask ourselves those questions, ask people in South Africa and India those questions. And I mean, user research and service design work that we all do as a kind of basic principle should also come into what, what harm could be done to you from this product as well. So maybe those are the questions that we should be asking. Uh, our users as well um, mm. and but i think that the problem is is trying to do all of those things as quickly as we all want to do them is really hard so doing that in a structured way i think that's a really good point um for us to include a bit of a call to action to our participants who are listening today um because one of the things we've been trying to do as part of um, the work that Bella and I are talking about to develop an ethical framework is to make a list of those questions, those prompts. And we've extended the consultation to get your input. Um, so the consultation is open and we've put a link into the, the chat and we hope to get your um, your input. We'd really like to have, you know, as diverse um, voices as possible. And if you think there is a better way or a different way, then we definitely want to hear from you. So please do um, provide us with some input. And Ian, one of the questions that, um, that you raised, I think, was whether we're looking to maybe translate the framework into different contexts and potentially different languages. And certainly one of the things that we're looking into is making it... Um, openly licensed so it can be adapted and remixed into different contexts and Ian I wonder whether you wanted to join into the conversation to yeah. get us further in our discussion. I mean I think it's in incredibly valuable that Alton making the ethical framework that they're developing an open publication and an open framework and that gives people the chance to look at translation issues and this actually connects with the Aperio communities that I represent who spend a lot of their time developing software. And there's a tendency to think about internationalization in linguistic terms, in terms of translation, rather than in cultural terms also. Now that, of course, adds development cycles, but it makes a product which is vastly more valuable in the long run. So I, that's a point that I, I didn't want to lose. But a, a few members of the panel have, have mentioned consent, uh, and I think Paul mentioned informed consent. Uh, and it's possible that the legality of data gathering might ultimately revolve around that concept. Could you... Could the panelists comment on what you feel informed consent might look like in higher education, first of all, uh, and then perhaps also make some comments about how equipped you feel higher education is, both culturally and technically, to secure and, and manage that consult, consent. Now, I am aware that that is a big question, and we've got 15 minutes, but perhaps, Paul, if I start with you, you give us some perspectives. You're muted. Uh, great. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. I do think I like to speak about consent as fragile. It, it is really until further notice. It is uh, There's enough evidence to show that notice and terms and conditions and consent is in, unable to really protect privacy. There's just too many loopholes, and the law is constantly trying to catch up. So I think an ethical framework to provide key pointers for consideration is most probably the way to go. Secondly, I, I do think it depends on how we see data. If we see data as, as a commodity that I own as property and you can steal my data and I must protect my data, 
or we can see data as a right and my right to privacy and I can control who has access to what, or we can see data as identity is an integral part of me. And I think that's, that's a view that is shared by many indigenous peoples that my blood samples, my digital footprints, the, it's part of me, it's my identity. You don't steal me, you don't steal from me, you steal my identity. You, so, so I think that is very important. And lastly, I do think if our notion of consent can, in, can encapsulate that data is relational, uh, it's about not only about my individual data, but when you have my data, you actually have access to the people around me, their data and my community. So it's, you use my data to inform decisions about people like me. So data is relational. Secondly, to ensure participant input in all aspects of our design and our use of learning technologies. That's very important. Thirdly, to ensure that our students and our users of our technology owns the data. And I know that's contestable. What will they do with their ownership? But I think it's community input. It's community uh, say in the, how their data are going to be used. And then finally is if we do use their data, if they do consent to use a particular learning technology, that we show them the benefits that they can provide input in the benefits and how they want to benefit from the data we collect from them. Thank you, Jan. Thanks, Paul. That's incredibly valuable. Bella, would you like to make a comment on that? I'm nodding vigorously at that idea, the idea that um, in, in order to gain consent, you can demonstrate to users about the benefits of, of the use of that technology. I think that's the the key. And I think I'm probably the, the GDPR veteran on the panel. Um, and I, I think that um, when we think uh, it's three years ago now my daughter is three years old and she uh, came into the world i think the day that gdpr became law uh, and um i think if we think back to what we thought about informed consent was when we were thinking about gdpr it was how can we write our statements to make sure that people properly read them not whether they actually genuinely give informed consent and i think we're moving beyond that now and back into all the points that that paul has just made on a daily basis, we all use in our lives so many products that consume our data. And the vast majority of those are not in the educational space. They are getting us to places. They are, um, we are buying services and all of those things. We all click a thing quickly because we want to do that thing. And the reality is, is that there are patterns and, and uh, things that everybody knows about us um, because we wanted to use that service. And I don't think that genuinely is informed consent. That is, um, you know, we, we click that button in order to do that. But in order for us to do all of the things that Paul talked about and the things that I would want our students to do, which is rather than a kind of blanket at the beginning, you agree to something, it's actually quite a long process. And you have to engage uh, users in um, the idea of what the product will do for them and why their data is important as part of that process. And then, like Paul says, you avoid issues around identity, um, the, the concept of theft, the fact that people feel harmed by the use of that technology. But doing that in such a way that doesn't kind of decrease user experience is critical. And, and that, I think, is the challenge that we all have, is how can you explain to someone cogently, quickly, what it is you're going to do with their data? And then for them to understand that rapidly in order to consent to it, to then use the service. I think it's important that institutions do it at a kind of global level for students. But I think that when we are building software and putting together different products as well to, to kind of provide services across HE, we should also be explaining that there is a lot of things that we know about people and bringing those things together um, and being able to clearly articulate to those consumers what those things are. Is a, I mean, it's an incredible challenge. And I, and I think for it to be realistically informed, it will require a huge amount of work. Thank you. Chuck? We could go for a whole hour on this. This is, we have really, a lot of really good ideas have come out here. And um, so I think that uh, consent is a disaster. And I'll tell you why. And that is, it, Paul is always talking about like the North Atlantic. Here in the middle of the United States of America, 
we are affected in the same kind of way by Silicon Valley. And that is that, you know, no one cares what we think. Silicon Valley makes decisions and then we're stuck with that. And so if we look at this obsession with consent, it's not really consent. What you're doing is waiving your rights. I mean, all these little things are waivers of rights, which means that Facebook, Google, Canvas, Blackboard, pop up a thing that basically says, I waive my rights. I'm not consenting to anything. I'm waiving my rights, which means that these companies do not have the laws applied to them, which means that all of the GDPR work that we did, which is a great thing, is null and void because the first thing you do is give up your rights. It just as a condition of entry, you give up your rights. And so I'll be honest, if we have more time to talk about this. I think consent is a waste of time. What I think we should do is come up with another of the GDPR's concepts, and that's the retention of data. If we could focus on the notion of, look, my university is going to retain some of this data for quite some time because I need a transcript, but you know, a lot of this other data really only needs to live for about six months. And if that data could just vanish, and so now what happens is all the things Paul was talking about, about it's me, it's my community, it's my society. Well, the data is gone, right? And, and so why are you holding this data forever? What, what is the university's purpose to hold all the data Paul was talking about literally forever? And the answer is, there is no good reason whatsoever to hold that data for more than perhaps six months, three months after the course is over. We do need to hold certain things, but then they should, we, know, we should know who holds them. And that is, my university holds my grades. My university has not outsourced the holding of my grades. And then if I've outsourced anything like to Google Docs or something, it goes away and we don't have expiration. And so I think, you know, the GDPR is, you know, it, it hasn't had the effect that we would like for it to have, but um, there's wonderful, wonderful ideas in it if we would just listen to it and do what it says. Bella, you've got a raised hand. I, and it's a really interesting <laughs> point, Chuck. And I'm going to bring in another dimension, which is the, uh, well, is it the legal? It's the political dimension in the UK. So we have the new office for students who are um, uh, a, a kind of government agency who, who monitor higher education. And I think uh, I, your point would be fantastic without the niggle in our minds that we might be asked to submit data to the government at any given point, and we don't know what that data might be. And so then I think you, you get into the kind of institutional loop of, well, there are a lot of things that we know about our students, and I think most of them probably fit within that six month horizon that you just talked about, but there's always the what if, what if. And I think that that's another thing that we probably as institutions, as educationists need to push back on, which is actually what is what, what do we actually need to hold about our students, both from, from a governance point of view and then uh, from a privacy point of view? And then, like you say, what can we delete? Because we never delete because we always think that it'll be useful at some point. Thanks. That's a really good point. Um, we're not getting questions from the, from the audience. So, audience, if you've got questions, please post them in Twitter with that hashtag OpenUpAreo21. Or if you're viewing this in pod, use the uh, use the frame there to post a question. But I wondered if uh, we've got three different panelists here from three very different places. Is there anything you want to ask one another to explore any of the things that you've heard over the course of this, this session and the preparation for it? Chuck, you have your real hand up. Yep. So... Marin, could you talk a little bit about like uh, IT leaders at various universities that you've kind of test marketed the the framework with, and like, do they just kick you right out of their office in five seconds, or do they go, oh, that's it? So, I'm, could you talk a little bit about actually like deploying this and talking to people about it and what their reaction is? Absolutely. So um, we've started this works in October last year and um, Bella alongside with two other trustees are chairing a working group, which includes um, over 100 people. And that includes learners all the way up to director level senior staff and also representation from industry. And our experience has been that there's a couple of different responses. So overall, the idea 
idea of a framework with principles is very welcome. But at a senior level in particular, there's obviously some concern that there's all sorts of existing frameworks and policies, which with that might have to align. Um, but the idea of having a checklist has come out actually really positive in the um, consultation that we've just done. So we've had 160 plus responses so far. And over three quarters of the people who responded would like to use a checklist, not in terms of checking a box to say we've complied, but having a checklist of prompts to guide their discussion, either internally or with suppliers. Because a lot of our members, I think, struggle to know what questions to ask suppliers. And particularly people who might not be you know, super passionate advocates of privacy already who haven't thought a great deal about this. Um, on the other spectrum of our membership, we have people who are so passionate about this work, they maybe feel we don't go quite far enough and want us to be more radical and make it more, um, more broad and maybe more abstract. And what we're trying to balance is something you know, between having the right principles, but also making it somehow practical because the community we represent um, includes many leaders and practitioners who, for whom this is maybe not a new thing, but certainly not something that they can devote all of their time on, however important they feel it is. And they need something very tangible. So by trying to align it with, you know, existing similar principles for learning analytics, for example, we've been trying to give them some tools to start the conversation rolling. And I think that's a little bit of what um, we discussed earlier, that, you know, we want to try and affect change at scale, not only for the enthusiasts or the passionate advocates um, that are out there. And in order to kind of lift everybody out of the sort of, oh, it's someone else's problem mindset, we need to give them I think, an entry into that conversation. Would you say that's fair, Bella? I would. And I think there's an... Um, I've really enjoyed the process that we've just gone through with our working group. I think engaging with a member-led community on something as complex as this has got huge benefit. Um, but as Maren said, we can't meet everyone's needs with that. So we are coming at it from a kind of balancing act. One of the things that I have noticed though, and this goes for colleagues that I've met from the US as well, Chuck, is that actually having something like this is really welcome because from senior people in institutions, not least because nothing like this really exists at the moment and a lot of people don't necessarily spend huge amounts of time thinking about privacy. It does come as part of a, a checklist or, or the kind of ethics of the use of technology. So having um, some concepts of principles and a checklist even if they're not perfect, is a really good starting point for people who um, who do want to kind of think about those things but wouldn't necessarily know where to begin. And I think that's been kind of one of the real benefits of, of the work we, we've done. We are almost at time, uh, and that seems like a good place to pause the conversation and allow it to continue through other channels. Uh, thanks to all our panellists. Thanks to all for agreeing to participate in this joint venture, which I sincerely hope is the first of many. I have a word from our sponsors before we leave. Sponsor Expo, breakout room assignments. Room one is Big Blue Button, engaging students online with Big Blue Button. Room two is long sight, stump the developer. Bring your thorny questions for Earl Neitzel and Adrian Fish. So there you go. Look forward to that. Thanks, everyone. Been a great time. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Merci. Au revoir. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Thanks, everybody. Great discussion. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.